Hello and welcome to Cool Season Vegetable Gardening. My name is Laura Monzinski and Karen Schaefer and I will be uh, doing this talk together. Karen and I are both uh, longtime master gardeners and vegetable gardeners. Um, we also have Sharon Erickson and Louise Christie who will be handling administration and uh, questions. So, um, Welcome, everybody. I'm sure we have a variety of people on the call. I'm sure we have some very experienced cool season gardeners who, like us, are always looking to learn something new. Gardening is an ongoing learning experience and an ongoing experiment. So welcome. Also, I'm sure there are people here who are growing cool season vegetable gardens for the very first time. Um, whether it's because you want to make sure about food security or whether you're home more often or for whatever reason, welcome you also. And I know that there are people from outside our area. Um, we will be focusing on Santa Clara County and the conditions and climate soil here. Um, but you're welcome um, to get some general gardening information. And then at the end, we will have information about how you can contact your local master gardener program for more specifics on your area. So tonight we're going to be talking about what is special and different about cool season vegetable gardening. We'll talk about how to set up a cool season garden, a um, little bit different, and also some specific vegetables that are good to grow in the cool season in Santa Clara County. So we'll talk about what some of these vegetables are, how to grow them, how to care for them, how to harvest them, and what pests and diseases you might look out for with certain um, vegetables. So certain vegetables and classes of vegetables tend to have some of the same problems. So we will talk about that. And in terms of questions, so this is a cool season vegetable talk. So please feel free to ask all your questions about cool season vegetables. So you can uh, type those in the chat and at the end of each section, uh, we will stop and uh, take questions on that particular topic. So uh, first we're going to talk about um, why plant a cool season garden, especially for those who are doing it for the first time. And I think the number one answer to that is because we can. <laughs> so a lot of us come from other areas where we cannot garden year round. And uh, Karen's from Minnesota, I'm from Pennsylvania. So for us to be able to garden year round here is wonderful. So um, this is not a, a garden shovel in my hand. This is a snow shovel. <laughs> And so it's really exciting to be able to, to grow during different parts of the year. So we can grow year round here. And uh, that's one thing that's exciting. I remember telling my husband once that my goal is to be able to eat something fresh out of the garden every single day of the whole year. And he said, that's great, but we can never go anywhere then. No vacations, nobody can get married, nobody can die, but now's our time, right? We're not going anywhere anyway. We're not traveling. So it's a good time to, to be eating something out of your garden all year round. Okay, so it's a good way to make use of your garden space. So a lot of people start out doing summer gardens and they do a, a warm season garden every year. But in terms of growing a cool season garden, what do you do in the winter? So one thing is on the left to just leave it, leave the dirt fallow. But you really don't want to do that for a couple of reasons. One is when it does rain, um, a lot of that topsoil that, that you have worked so hard to build up to get healthy will wash away. It will erode. You don't want that to happen. Also, you have a lot of organisms that live in your soil, worms, beneficial fungus, good bacteria, a lot of things that, that live in your soil, and they need organic matter to eat and survive. And if everything, if there's nothing on the top, it's not protecting the, uh, allowing, holding in moisture, it's not giving anything for them to eat, 
then you start to lose that life of your soil. And you want good soil life because that supports your plants and creates this whole sustainable ecosystem. Another possibility, so you can cover that with compost or um, a manure, um, even a fresh manure. Usually if you're gonna put manure on your vegetables, you want them to be um, uh, well composted so it doesn't burn your vegetables, but you can put fresh manure on during the summer and um, or during the cool season and that will work its way in and amend your soil all winter long. Or you can plant cover crops. You saw on the right, there were some cover crops. And what they do is they protect the soil. There's something growing there. They can, um, uh, and, and some of those will add nutrients such as nitrogen to the soil. So may as well, instead of those things, grow something that you can actually eat. So um, another benefit to growing in the cool season is nature helps with the watering. We put a lot of energy and a lot of time into watering our gardens. But in the winter, lots of times it will rain and, and that will take care of a lot of it for you. So you don't have to be out there with a the hose a couple times a week. But you do need to keep an eye on it too because uh, we do have droughts and, and it may go long periods without uh, receiving water. So just kind of keep an eye on it and make sure that it is uh, getting enough water. If it's not getting enough for the rain, go ahead and, and water it. Also during the cool season, you have fewer pest diseases and weeds. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean you don't have any. Um, you will have to spend some time maintaining it. Uh, looking out for pests and weeds, but you don't have nearly as many. Um, you, you're not going to have a lot of aphids like you have during the summer. Um, a lot of the pests, and we'll talk about some of the specific ones you do see, but you don't have nearly as many. And you don't have nearly as many weeds either. The reason weeds are a problem is they compete with your vegetables for water and nutrients. And so you want those available to what you're going to eat, not to the weeds that you're gonna pull up and throw away. So get those out of there as soon as you can, especially before they go to seed. So you can spend more time just focusing on the vegetables and, and nursing those along and, and then harvesting them and, and eating them. Okay, also um, in the winter, they're kind of like in a natural refrigerator to a certain extent, they, they can stay out there longer. In the summer, um, if you've got tomatoes, they, they may you know, start to rot if you don't pick them right away. Something like green beans will go to seed and stop producing if you don't pick them right away. So you have to be out there every day or two in the summer. But in the winter, um, they, can, they can last a lot longer. They're, they're kind of a, in a little bit of a cold storage. So if it's not pleasant for being out, you can just wait a few days, especially root vegetables that are in the ground where the, the temperature is, is very even. Um, you can just kind of leave them a little bit longer. Now, sometimes it gets a little too cool. <laughs> so uh, sometimes you might get a, a frost, either a light frost or a hard frost, occasionally a freeze. And this varies even within our county. I talked about we're focusing on our county, but even within our county, in the north part of the county, very rarely are there hard frosts or freezes, whereas in the southern part of the county, Morgan Hill, Gilroy, that happens a lot more often. So you have to be aware of that. Now, some vegetables actually will taste a little better with a, a light frost. Um, the, the starches will turn to sugar and they'll taste a little bit sweeter. So kale might be one that, that would taste a little bit better with a light frost. But if you get a hard frost or a freeze, a lot of these vegetables you wanna uh, protect from that um, because it can do, do some damage. So a couple of things that you can do, one is, if the vegetables are well watered before a freeze, they will do better. Um, if they've got that moisture in their cells, they're less likely to be damaged. You can also put a row cover. So a row cover is available at garden supply places and it's kind of a gauzy fabric that, that goes over your vegetables has a lot of different uses. It can keep out pests, it can keep things warmer, it can keep things uh, from sunburning, a lot of uses. 
but this is something that you can put over um, when it looks like you might have a, a cold weather. Um, also, and especially at night, it doesn't usually happen during the day, but at night. And then you can make a frame out of uh, wood or PVC pipe that you can put a uh, fabric over, even like an old sheet or something, but you don't wanna let it touch the vegetables directly because you can get sort of a freezer burn. So uh, just a, a kind of frame to put that around. So depending on the area, you may wanna to watch for that at night. If you have it covered at night, Take the cover off during the day. It's almost always going to be warm enough during the day. Let some sun in, let it photosynthesize, but just kind of keep an eye on that depending on, on where you are. So Karen's going to talk about planning and setting up your cool season garden. Do we want to ask if there's any questions for you before I start going? Louise, any questions or comments on this? I think probably there'll be more when we get into specific vegetables. Yeah, I think the questions that we have so far are ones that you're going to address as you move along. Okay, well, let's move on then. So planning. Well, obviously one of the first questions you will ask yourself is what does your family like to eat? So plant things that you're going to eat and that you'd like to eat a lot of. But consider also things like, are things better if they're fresh? Peas, for instance, start to turn to starch once they've been harvested. So the, the fresh out of the garden peas are incredibly sweet and delicious and are, are a real garden treat. Fresh carrots out of the garden have an amazing perfume. Carrots start to uh, turn, get a soapy flavor when they're in stored with other uh, fruits, especially like apples. So fresh out of the garden, carrots are just amazing. Consider things that are expensive uh, to buy or, or difficult to find. Specialty greens, unusual. You know, we're seeing many more unusual heirloom varieties being offered in the market, but there's, there's even more out there. Uh, so the fun to grow stuff, uh, if you go and look at, well, at the nurseries, but also at seed companies, there's lots of seed companies online. There are seed exchanges like Seed Savers Exchange, where you can exchange with other uh, seed enthusiasts. Lots of things out there. And then consider what gives good return for garden space. So we'll talk about that quite a bit as we talk about various vegetables. But chard, for instance, will you can keep harvesting chard for months. You just keep picking it, it just keeps growing, as opposed to a cabbage that, where you get one cabbage. So then consider uh, what fits into a garden space. You can actually put quite a lot in a small area. This slide was donated. We don't know exactly how big this plot is. I'm guessing it's maybe 10 feet across there at the widest. And you can see that this person has laid out many, many small spots for lots of different vegetables. So that can be a great way to get a lot of different produce in a small area. Uh, it, this does mean though that you may not want to plant an entire six pack of something. It may just be more than you can fit into that area. We're gonna talk about the spacing because it's really important that you give plants the amount of space that they need, especially in the cool season. Crowding your plants is not going to do, give you any benefits. It's not gonna do them a favor and it's not gonna help you. So in this, uh, in this particular garden plan, I'm hoping that north is on the bottom of the picture here, or maybe to the, uh, to the side where it says peas, because the peas are going, going to get taller than a lot of the other things. So you have to make sure that you don't have tall plants shading uh, small plants. And you, you really need to make sure, let's see, well, the cauliflower and the cabbage, see those two patches? I don't think this person has allowed enough room for them. We'll talk about those a little bit later. So. Uh -huh. You can plant in the ground, in raised beds, or in containers. Now, if your raised beds are in contact with the ground, that's like planting in the ground, 
if you um, if your plants if your raised beds have bottoms, then they're more like growing in containers. So for containers, you'll want to use a good potting soil, um, nine to eighteen inches in depth, approximately. Uh, we have a container gardening section on our website where we talk a lot about what plants need and the depths and, and uh, dealing with the soil and things like that. In ground, you'll need your typical preparation for vegetable gardening, which means that you dig in some compost, you amend it, you need to have a way to water your beds, you need to fertilize them properly. Again, we've got a, a, uh, a section on our website for beginning vegetable gardening where we address many questions like this. Now, most of us in Santa Clara County have a clay soil, which is heavy and, and can be sticky when it hasn't been amended, but it's very, very rich in plant nutrients. So, and it also retains water. So both of those are really good for us. And by amending it regularly with compost, uh, organic matter such as compost, it's a really great soil to garden in. Uh, Santa Clara composting, home composting education site has lots of information about how to compost, compost sources that are available to you. So uh, do check that out. The only fertilizer, so assuming you have this wonderful clay soil, the only fertilizer you would really need to add is nitrogen. And you always need to add nitrogen because plants use it as they grow and it's water soluble. So it washes out as we irrigate, as the rains fall. So every time you plant annual vegetables, spring, summer, fall, add a little nitrogen in some form, but don't add too much, especially if you're using a concentrated form of nitrogen, a, you know, a product like miracle Grow or something like that. It's very easy to over fertilize. And uh, so pay attention to their recommended applications. More is not always better. If excess nitrogen will result in too many leaves, not enough flowers, possibly small roots. It uh, can also attract more insects because the plants will be growing very lush and fast. So, so just pay attention to what the recommended uh, amount of nitrogen is. So, now, the sun. So it, vegetables, there is no such thing as a low sun, um, low light vegetable. All vegetables need a lot of sun, at least six hours, preferably eight hours. And I tell you, eight hours in the winter is difficult to get because the, our, we just don't have that much sun in the winter. So in the summer, the sun is very high in the sky. And the days are long, so there's lots of sun to be had in the winter. The sun is low in the sky, which means it's casting long shadows. And this means more shade from buildings, more shade from fences, more shade from trees, although maybe not more shade from deciduous trees. If you have a deciduous tree, the ones that drop their leaves, then you might have more sun. So pay attention to how much sun your garden area is getting. And you have to be honest with yourself because you can't fool the plants. They need full sun and uh, they know how much sun that they're getting. If you have, if it's, you're really not sure you're going to have enough, then focus on leafy greens. Leafy greens are simply growing the leaves, so lettuce and chard and spinach. Uh, as opposed to the ones that are trying to produce the fruit like peas or roots like, like um, uh, beets or carrots. So I ended up with a front yard vegetable garden uh, because my backyard is just too shady. It's great, I have full sun. It's also great for talking to people going by and giving away produce. And it, it's, uh, it's actually, there's a lot of advantages to it. I do have a nice beauty strip that separates my, my garden from the sidewalk, so that's something to do. Uh, containers are, can be a great way to deal with a lack of sun. You might have, say, a patio that you normally use in the summer, but you're not going to be using it as much in the winter, and that's where all the sun is. So I know people who do container gardening in the winter because that's how they get their sun. 
So we have what is called a Mediterranean climate here. It means we have warm, dry summers and cool, wet winters. And this is named for the, obviously the Mediterranean region. And you'll find as we go through the vegetables that a lot of them are especially Italian. There's a lot of Italian vegetables that grow really well here because Mediterranean. So you notice that our highs in the winter are not that cold really. It tends to be in the 50s and 60s in the winter. So 50s and 60s, that's like spring in many other areas of the country. So the vegetables that we grow for our winter vegetables are often considered spring vegetables elsewhere. And I'd also like to point out that in the spring though, uh, you see that the high temperatures are warming up gradually over a long period of time. Whereas in the, in the fall here, they drop quite quickly down to the low temperatures. That's going to come up in just a minute. So here is our cycle of planting. So our, uh, everyone knows about the, the summer vegetables. We plant those in April, May, and June, and those are what we're growing right now. Before that, in February and March, we could be planting spring vegetables in what is truly our spring. So almost everything we talk about here today could be planted in February and March. But what we really want to talk about today is the fall planting season, August through October. So it's important to get started early because the soil is warm now, the plants will get established. But remember how Laura said that, that the plants are going to be refrigerated? As it cools down, they're going to start growing slower and slower and slower. So if you get them in soon enough here in August and September, and maybe earliest part of October, don't go too far into October, then they will get established well. They'll be growing strongly by the time it starts to cool down. And then they'll just be waiting for you all winter long. It's really, really lovely. All right, so I can hear, even though you're all muted, but I can hear you saying, but what about my summer vegetables that are still in my garden? Okay, transitioning from the summer. It is a trade-off between the last of the tomatoes and the peppers and the zucchini and being able to have fresh vegetables all winter long. So. Sometimes you do need to harden your heart a little and say, I want my broccoli and take something out. But also consider, you know, so here's some tomatoes that are looking kind of sick. Yes, it's got a bunch of, of little yellow tomatoes on it and I will harvest those, but I'm about ready to take that plant out. And the zucchini, that one just went out yesterday in the green waste. It was, that was done. And honestly, I'm kind of tired of zucchini too. So think about how you're going to transition. You can also start snipping off flowers in, in August or now to prevent new fruits from setting. You know, I actually took out several of my tomatoes a few weeks ago because I looked at them and I realized they had nothing but tiny green tomatoes on them. They had a couple of them that were ripening and then nothing, and then a bunch of green ones that we're not gonna be able to ripen in any decent amount of time. So I just took them out. You could also, if you have ones that you really, really want to keep, you can try to plant in between the plants. We call this interplanting, and it'll actually let you take advantage of the shade that they're casting and give, the, uh, give your new seedlings a bit of protection from the sun. When you go to remove the old plants, it does mean you'll have to be very careful about removing them. You don't just yank them out of the soil because you wouldn't want to disturb the new ones. And with some experience, you can start to uh, plan your summer garden knowing what you might want to take out and make room for the new ones. So this is a snippet from our vegetable planting chart on our website. 
And this, these are recommendations for here in central Santa Clara County. Uh, you need to get to know your own microclimate to figure it out. Has lots of information, when to plant, when to direct seed, even tells you how long it takes to go from seed to transplant if you're trying to raise your own transplants yourself. So you can see that beet, bok choy, and broccoli are all spring and fall vegetables. You can plant those in the spring and you can plant them now in the fall. If you click on any one of those vegetables there, it will take you to a page that has lots of information about that vegetable. So if you clicked on tomato, it would take you to our page about tomatoes. And if you're having problems with your tomatoes, you can click on this pest management link here and it'll take you to the UC Integrated Pet Pest Management page, IPM for short, about tomatoes. There is so much on this website, so much information. If you're having problems with any with your tomatoes, if you know that you're having problems with a specific pest like, like spider mites, you can look these up on this website and find out what to do, how to identify it, how to manage it. So if we clicked on, for instance, rats, you have this whole page about rats that tells you how to manage those. So lots of information there. I know I just put a, <laughs> put a lot out there, but you have so many resources and I wanted to make sure that you knew about those. All right, I'm going to hand you back to Laura here to start talking about cool seeds and vegetables. Uh, Louise, were there any questions about that material? Yes, there are a few. And I'd, I'd especially, even though you may have covered some of this, I'd like you to reiterate about vegetables in the shade because people are asking. Well, the, if you, the answer. If you only have you can try to grow leafy greens like lettuce, arugula, uh, mustard greens, maybe chard, but even those are going to need at least five hours of sun. If you really have nothing but shade, you've got to find some place that gets sun or else, or else you grow some shade loving uh, ornamental plants. And the other question I think that would be really great if you could address is a little bit about preparing the soil or transitioning the soil from the summer bed to the fall bed um, and, and also containers. How do I transition the soil in the can container like a half barrel where I had my tomatoes after I pull them? What do I do with that soil to grow my winter crops in my half barrel? Well, Again, we have lots of this information on our website, so that, that's definitely a place to go to, to remind yourself of what to do. But basically, if you're in the ground, add some more compost and, and add some fertilizer, some nitrogen. And in, the, uh, in containers, you might want to add a little more fresh potting soil. You don't have to replace the potting soil entirely unless you have a disease. And and you might need to add a little uh, fertilizer at that point. Many uh, potting soils do come with some fertilizer in them. So again, you don't want to over fertilize. So look at what is in your, your soil and you may not need to add anything more. I also um, saw, an, um, if I can, there was another one about worm compost and, and soil. And if you need to use uh, fertilizer, if you're using worm compost or, or vermicompost or worm castings, whatever you call it. So that's, you know, that's very much a fertilizer. Um, so you don't, depending on what you're growing, that really helps. But if you grow something that uses a lot of nitrogen, and nitrogen is for the green growth. So things that are mostly green, like a lot of these uh, winter vegetables, lettuce, spinach, uses a lot of nitrogen, and it goes into the plant, we pull that off and we eat it. So we do need to replace that. So, you know, if it's healthy with just the worm castings, that's fine. But some of these that are mostly green may uh, benefit from some extra nitrogen especially in a container, because if something's in the ground, it can put roots out, it can connect with beneficial fungus to get extra nutrients. But if it's a con in a container, especially once it's used up, that's, that's kind of it. 
Um, I do see one other uh, soil related question that, that I wanted to uh, just address real quickly or, or refer you a uh, question about all the smoke and ash going on right now. So we do have a monthly uh, gardening tips newsletter that goes out on the first of every month and on our web page on the front page there's a link to that. And the first tip for September has to do with smoke and ash and how that might affect your garden. And there are links in that to studies that uh, Sonoma County Cooperative Extension did after their fires a couple years ago. So I recommend you go read those because there's, there's a bit to learn and that's something that's affecting all of us right now. Okay, so I think I'm gonna go on to the cool season vegetables. So what we're gonna do here is look into some of the specific vegetables. And we'll be talking in families because uh, vegetables that are in the same family tend to do well with the same growing conditions and get some of the same uh, problems, pests and diseases. So uh, we'll be talking about salad greens, uh, lettuce, other, other greens that you may or may not have heard of or eaten or grown before. Uh, peas, uh, they can be planted in the fall and the early spring. Other greens, some things that you might not want, might not put in a salad, but you might uh, cook up as, as greens. Members of the cabbage family. So that's a, a really big one uh, during the winter. And root crops, things that, that grow in the ground, that natural refrigerator that they're in. Fennel, fun, a little bit different kind of anise flavor to grow. Fava beans, which can be grown as a cover crop in one of those first slides or to eat or a combination. When I plant fava beans, they're half for the soil and half for me. <laughs> And then another thing to grow is alliums. And we're not really gonna be talking about those because it's a little early to plant those. Usually around November 1st is, is when you would put those in. So we're not really gonna talk about those. You'll notice one thing that is not on this list is winter squash. Um, winter squash is unfortunately named <laughs> because um, it's called winter squash because it's stored over the winter, not because you plant it in the winter. So both summer squash and winter squash are planted in the winter. So I just, if you were expecting to see winter squash, <laughs> it's really not something that we grow in the winter. Okay, so let's get into some of the specifics. So lettuce. So many different kinds of lettuce, so many things you can do in the lead, with lettuce. You can grow it in the summer, maybe, um, but it doesn't do as well. Um, if you don't grow it in the summer, how are you going to have a, a salad with your tomatoes, right? Uh, but it tends to bolt quickly in the summer, meaning it goes to seed. So it puts up this seed head in the middle, and then the leaves, you know, the, all the energy is going into the seeds and no longer into the leaves, and it's bitter. I did plant some um, this summer, partly because I, I wanted it to go to seed so I could have fresh seeds. <laughs> so I did plant some. It was kind of bitter, so I didn't make salads, but I, I just put some on sandwiches and, and a little bit like that. Um, but in the winter is when it grows really well, tastes really good. And there are a lot of different kinds of lettuce. And so they're kind of like four different categories, but they're, they're really kind of a continuum. So you have the head lettuce that, that grows a very specific head, like iceberg um, lettuce that you might see in the store that, that makes a firm head. And so you kind of take the head all at once, but you will have some leaves on the outside that are not really part of that tight head. So go ahead and eat those as, as you go along as the head is forming. So eat the loose outer leaves. Once the head forms, and it's, it's nice and firm, not hard, then you can harvest the rest of the plant. Now you also have some things like romaine lettuces that have kind of tall, narrow leaves that form a head, but not the same kind of tight head. It's, it's a looser head. Then you have the, the butter head squashes, which are round, but a, kind of a, also a, a loose head, not that firm head. And then uh, loose leaf lettuces where it's, you know, more kind of individual leaves, you never form a head. And those you just eat the leaves as it grows. So you take off the outer leaves, which are also the lower leaves, which are also the older leaves as they mature. And 
more leaves keep coming from the inside. So you just keep eating as it goes along. And then sometimes you can uh, get seed mixes that have a few different kinds in there together. And, you know, they, they will have been chosen so that they're compatible, so that they have similar growth patterns, similar water needs, similar fertilizer needs. So a lot of, lot of different possibilities for lettuce. So, and a lot of different uh, flavors. So kind of experiment, different colors. So in terms of harvesting them, here's a, a picture where you can see um, cutting off um, and, and the outer leaves the lower leaves as they grow up. And you don't, you want to be careful not to leave too much of a stub for, for disease to enter. And you can just keep eating all along um, and, and eat over the course of several weeks or, or a couple months with that, that same lettuce. So once it's kind of uh, getting a little bit old, it will bolt. So you can see that it puts up this seed head. Now this doesn't um, have the seeds on it yet, but it's just about to. So you notice it's not, you know, so nice and round. And the leaves will, will sort of look like they're almost shriveling up a little, kind of shrinking. They're not these nice big lush leaves. And so once you get to this point, the lettuce isn't going to taste it as good. So if you're not planning to save the seeds, if you are planning to save the seeds, let that go to seed, take those and grow them next year. But if you're not, you can put, take them out when, when it starts to look at, like this. They're not, they're not going to be as good to eat. Now, lettuce is very tender, delicate, easy to eat. <laughs> um, there was one year I planted my lettuce four times and something kept eating it. So, you know, it's close to the ground and, and very delicate. So what I do now is I start it in pots. I start it in small containers and then put it in the ground when it's a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, and it's not going to be eaten as quickly. Or I'll just plant them in large containers, like uh, the old recycling bins that are kind of the shape of a rubber made bin or half wine barrel, some, some kind of large container. The roots don't go very deep, so you don't need a, a, the deepest container like you would for, for uh, some of the, the larger vegetables. Um, cabbage is a little bit bigger, it, it would go a little bit deeper, but lettuce not as much. So you can just leave it in a container or get it a little bit strong if you don't want to be constantly combating uh, pests. So you have the pests that come up from the ground, which is, is one of the reasons that I don't uh, any longer put it directly in the ground from seed. Um, also, you get pests from above. So um, Row covers is one way to keep those pests from above. So those might be uh, birds. So if you see holes in your leaves, especially um, not necessarily at the edge, but in the middle of the leaves, that, that could likely be birds pecking at those. They might take the seeds before it even gets to that. So, you know, that will, will keep that from happening. So those are, are good um, to put on at the beginning. Once it starts to grow up, be a little bit stronger, especially if it's something that produces flowers and needs to pollinate, you want to take those off once it's grown a little bit more so that they can pollinate. So this is the same kind of uh, row cover that uh, you would use sometimes for uh, very cold weather or maybe really hot sun. So these are usually made of like a polypropylene or a polyester so that they don't hold on to the water the way a, a natural fabric like cotton might. Uh, so water can pass through and sunlight also can pass through. Usually about 85% of sunlight passes through. Um, so your plants uh, should do well under that for the most part and be protected. Um, when when the uh, at the previous slide there were snails and slugs, so that's another thing that, that can attack. Those um, can be handpicked, uh, especially early in the morning or late in the evening. That's that's uh, usually when they're out uh, in the moister conditions, heat of the day. Uh, with a strong sun, you're not going to see them. So go out in the morning, handpick them, maybe put them in a, in a bucket of soapy water or something like that. Uh, one of our master gardeners crushes them and puts them in her compost bin because she figures they've been eating her vegetables. They're full of vegetable material. <laughs> so she puts them in her compost bin, um, but not live because they'll, they'll reproduce in there. They'll, they'll like those conditions. 
Okay, and then uh, besides lettuce are a lot of different kind of more exotic greens. So that's one thing that uh, Karen mentioned is grow something that's hard to find in the store or expensive in the store. Um, with farmers markets, it's a li little easier to find things, but um, growing your own is, is lots of fun. So arugula is something that is a green, can be used in salads, um, topped on pizza, it has a little bit of a peppery taste, and this really reseeds readily. So you might only plant arugula once in your life, and it'll just keep coming back over and over. May or may not be where you want it, um, but it's really easy to grow. So there are times that maybe I don't get my uh, cool season vegetable garden planted right away, but I always have arugula. There are certain things. I always have kale, always have arugula, always have spinach. There are certain things that uh, keep going or, or reseed themselves. Okay, others are, these are some of the more unusual ones. Uh, mosh is a, a kind of a nutty uh, green, delicious, but very small. So, you, you know, you're kind of out there with the scissors clipping it. It's a bit of work, but uh, people have tried it, usually think it's worth it. So some of these that are, are harder to find in the stores, uh, grow them in your garden and just go pick them whenever you want and uh, have something have something a little bit different. Another um, category of greens is, is the chicories, like radicchio, um, there's, uh, the Catalonia pugliese is a, an Italian uh, chicory. Little bit different, uh, really delicious. They have a little bit of, uh, some people will call it a bitter flavor. So you wanna make sure you like that. Um, not everybody does, a lot of people do. Um, so if you have an opportunity to try it before you invest all that uh, time in fertilizer and water and something, um, you may be more likely to find these at a farmer's market or a fellow gardener who grows them and, and give them a try and, and maybe you can go ahead and plant something different. So Louise, any questions on these salad greens? Yeah, there's a couple of things I think you might want to address. Um, one of them is about when you see the raggedy edges on spinach in particular, but on any green, how can you tell what the pest is? And I was wondering if you could describe how to distinguish between snail damage and bird damage. Well, as the birds I mentioned, lots of times they're in the middle of the leaves too, because they'll sit on the leaf <laughs> and, you know, they'll land on the middle of the leaf and, and sit on the leaf or, or land on something nearby. And so um, they may be in the middle of the leaf. Something that crawls towards it, like a snail or a slug or an earwig that crawls towards it will come to the outer edge first. So you're more likely to find it on the outer edge. Um, for those those crawling uh, critters, and there you know there are different things you can do. I mentioned hand picking. Um, sometimes there are uh, for snails and slugs or iron phosphate uh, baits that break down into sort of a fertilizer. Um, that's a personal preference. Some, that's uh, uh, considered safer, which is a little bit different than, than safe. There are also for earwigs. Some people will put out a little. Uh, container of beer, and it's actually the yeasty smell that attracts them. So you can put a, a yeast sugar mixture if you don't want to waste your beer um, that will attract them and the, they'll go into that and, and drown. So what you can do, we'll have a link at the end for our University of California IPM pages, Integrated Pest Management, and it will give you uh, different specific ideas to do with different pests. And if you know the pest, you can go ahead and look it up. But one thing that's great, as um, Karen was showing with the tomatoes, is if you put in what the plant is, there are pests that commonly affect those particular plants. So they'll give you a list of those. And then you can look, it's like, oh yes, my damage looks just like this. This is what I can do. This is the life cycle of this pest. This is the time to do it. Okay, so we're ready to oh, go oh, on. I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, there was a little glitch in my internet, so I didn't catch the end of what Laura was saying. Um, there, there are a couple more questions, if you don't mind if we take some more now. or is, Sure, yeah, just a couple, um, yeah. Yeah, so there's been a couple of questions about lettuce seed. People seem to be interested in saving the seed from their lettuce. Um, 
Someone says my summer lettuce has seeds forming on it now. Are those good for planting right now? Yes, I just picked some off of mine last week and I plan to plant them as soon as it's safe to breathe outside. <laughs> so yes, because those are already dried. I mean, there are some seeds like, you know, tomatoes that, that need to, uh, they have a protective coating that need to break down. Um, but those should be okay to plant right, right away. They sh as long as they're fully matured and dried, um, go ahead and plant those. I do want to say something about, you know, if you're saving seeds, if you have a seed packet, it'll have the directions on that for exactly how to plant it. If you don't have the packet, a kind of rule of thumb is whatever the diameter of the seed is, plant it two or three times that depth. The seed itself has some food in, in it um, to feed it until it gets up to the surface and can then start to photosynthesize and, and create its own food. So, you know, you think the bigger the seed, the more food it has in it, the, the deeper you can plant it. So that's, that's kind of a rule of thumb with seeds. Um, another question was about um, doing a baby lettuce bed. What what are your thoughts about that? Like a cut and come again, or a, or sorry, a, um, a, when you plant them together tightly, as a like a mescaline bed. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, with the cut and come, you want to leave maybe three or four inches between them. Um, and it's not so much on the surface, it's underneath, because that's where they're getting their nutrients and waters is underneath. So it may look okay on top, but you need room for the roots. If they get too crowded, they're going to be competing for, you know, just a few. If you're doing head lettuce, you might want to do about, you know, 10 inches apart. But um, usually those seeds are small, you might just spread them out. They come up really thick. Probably thinning them, you'll get uh, better leaves on the plants that are remaining. Best way to do that is cut them at surface level with a pair of scissors, because if you try to pull them out, you're going to damage the roots that are intertwined with other roots, so you can do damage to plants that, that are remaining. So if they don't look like they're thriving, they probably need to be thinned if they're close together. And those thinnings are your first harvest. <laughs> right, right. Yes, go ahead and eat them. Wait till they're a little bit bigger to eat. That's an excellent point. Yep. So I want Karen to, uh, to start and, and, you know, hopefully we'll have time. I love the questions. Thank you so very much. Okay, so let's talk about peas. Peas are one of my favorite winter vegetables to grow. As Laura mentioned, I'm from Minnesota. And in Minnesota, we go from blizzards to blazing sun with hardly any time in between. So growing spring uh, cool loving vegetables like peas can be a real challenge. So here, if you plant your peas soon enough, which means pretty much now, uh, you can, the production will start in December typically. It might take a little bit of a pause during the coldest months if we're having a little bit of frost at night, it might nip the flowers, won't hurt the vines usually, might nip the flowers a bit, but whenever it gets warm enough, they'll start flowering again and you'll just be getting peas all winter long. Typically you'll get production through February or March. It's just fabulous. Now, peas do need some sort of support if you're growing obviously if you're growing the tall ones that get get five or six feet tall you definitely need a trellis and but even the small ones that claim to be self-supporting it's really much better to give them a little bit of support because the pods are heavy as the peas start to develop so if you don't have support on those low ones the pods are heavy enough that they'll bend the plants towards the ground where they're much more likely to get nibbled on by snails or they, they get, uh, you know, these diseases happen. So it's really much better to give them some support, just a low support and a tall support for the tall ones. Now peas have tendrils. You can see in this picture here that they have tiny little tendrils that twine around and they need something thin to cling to as opposed to the beans. And yes, I know this is, these are beans at the end of the season and they're starting to turn yellow, but it lets you see very well how the entire stem of the bean is winding itself around the entire thing. So a bean can wind around quite a thick support like, like these bamboo supports, whereas peas need something thin, like a tomato cage, like a wire, a string even, you can use netting, there's quite a number of things, but it has to be thin enough. 
Uh, peas are the main problem we have with peas in this area is something called powdery mildew. And it honestly looks like somebody went out there with baby powder and sprinkled it on your leaves. It's called a mildew, but it actually doesn't like water. What it likes are warm, dry days and cool nights. When do we have warm, dry days? Well, in the early fall, that's not a problem, and in the spring. So you can plant peas in the spring, like in February or so, but when I was doing that here in my garden, what would happen is just as the peas were really starting to produce, bam, powdery mildew would hit, and that would be the end of them. So frustrating. So when I learned to plant peas in the fall, I'm in heaven. Now I have peas all winter long. Other possible problems with peas are slugs, snails, and birds nipping off the seedlings as they emerge from the soil. You can start peas in pots in a, ahead of time. They're, uh, they're very easy to start in the ground, but you do have to keep an eye out for them, use some of the protections that Laura talked about, or you can start them in pots and transplant them. You don't want to start them very much ahead of time, two, three weeks is all, because they're going to be developing a root and they're going to be shooting up very quickly. So uh, please give, give peas a try. It's so easy to start from seed yourself. Cabbage family. So yes, the cabbage family is one of the stars of the, the winter garden and broccoli is the star of the cabbage family. The cabbage family also called coal crops, brassicas. Um, they, they love the cold weather. They often taste better when they've been touched by a bit of uh, frost, the cool weather as Laura mentioned. Broccoli, you'll want to harvest when it gets to be when, when the head looks right. And that's a little hard to explain, but it may not be as big as the broccoli head that you see in the grocery store, but you look at those little nubs and when the nubs look like they've gotten to be about the right size, that's when you will pick it because those nubs are actually flower buds. And if you let your broccoli keep growing, you're going to see these little yellow flowers starting to form. And you see how it's kind of spreading out into those separate floors. Now, this is still perfectly edible. The flowers are edible. If you get a lot of flowers, if it starts to really spread out, some of those uh, stems are going to get a bit wiry and, and not very, the, the texture will change. But it is still perfectly fine to eat. But your next head, you'll want to pick a little sooner. Now, one of the reasons I say that broccoli is a star in the garden is that it forms something called side shoots. So you see that dark spot in the center. That's where the main head was. You clip off that main head, and then everywhere where the leaf joins the stem, so it's the leaf axle, there's a little potential bud there. When the head above it is cut off, then that one starts to grow, and you get these little side shoots. So they're like little mini heads of broccoli. They're selling them now often in the farmer's market. And it's, it's just lovely. It's like you already have your, your broccoli into these small little florets for you. One of the problems that you might see for broccoli is the imported cabbage worm, which is the larva of the caterpillar of the imported cabbage butterfly. So those are those little white butterflies kind of creamy, yellow, whitish uh, colored butterflies you see fluttering around, usually in pairs, usually looking for a place to lay their eggs. Uh, the, the caterpillar is this little velvety green caterpillar. Here it's in the middle of the leaf, but often you'll find it right on the, the rib of the leaf, laying right along the rib of it, which is a very good place for it to disguise itself, to be kind of hard to spot. But when you see nibbles on the edges of the leaf. This is another thing to, to look for. You don't find slugs and snails so much on the cabbage family leaves. They, they may do it when they're, when they're really young and tender, but they quickly get to be rather tough for those. So once you, when you see nibbles on 
uh, larger leaves, it might be these guys. Now, personally, I like seeing those little butterflies fluttering around my garden, and I can spare some leaves as long as the plants are big enough. So I really only worry about these when the plants are quite young and the damage from them could easily uh, just eliminate the plant altogether. So you can, there are various things you can do. You can cover them with the row cover and simply prevent access to the, uh, to the plant. You can look for the egg. So that little white dot in the lower, uh, lower right corner, that is one of the eggs that they, that they lay, often on the top, sometimes underneath. So you may have to check both sides of the leaf. So that's something you can just brush that off and, and that'll be it. You can also use something called BT, the Phyllis thuringiensis, and it is a caterpillar killer, right? As this says, this is one brand. Um, it, it will kill any caterpillar, so obviously you'd want to be very careful about where you used it because we like most caterpillars, right? We like the butterflies. But you can use this if for some reason you're not able to use some of these other possible controls. I will mention too that there is a, uh, a test that we've seen about 10 years ago, we saw a whole bunch of these come in and they were really a problem for a year or two. And then they, they sort of went away and we hardly saw them at all. So who knows, maybe a natural uh, predator followed them in, uh, maybe the conditions, you know, maybe they have a boom and bust cycle, we don't quite know. But uh, it's called the grata bugs. They're quite small, they're about a quarter of an inch. So I have a picture here of it next to the harlequin bug, which is another stink bug. Uh, the harlequin bug is about, it's almost an inch, it's really quite large. And they're not so numerous. You, you'll see a few of them around at a time, but you don't usually don't see a whole flock of them. I don't know what a bunch of bugs is called. Maybe they're a bunch of bugs. So the Vigratas can do quite a bit of damage. So if you see that kind of damage, look for those little stink bugs. Uh, hand pick them, remove susceptible plants. They're attracted to, especially attracted to members of the cabbage and the mustard family, including alyssum which many of us used to grow as a beneficial attractor in our winter garden. But when we found that the heart, that the Bagrata bugs loved the alyssum, I know I took all of mine out. So we don't know if that maybe is what helped, um, but just wanted to give you a little heads up about those. All right, so other members of the cabbage family, cauliflower. Cauliflower is fun to grow. It comes in these cool colors now, the purple. There's a, a, an orange one uh, that I don't have pictured that's high in beta carotene, so more nutritious. Uh, I love the Romanesco types that have those, those fractal-like towers growing all over them. The thing about cauliflowers is that you only get one. They do not have side shoots the way broccoli does. And you can see from the picture on the right, how big those leaves are. Those leaves are like three feet across and they need, every cauliflower plant needs two to three feet in distance. If it doesn't have enough room, it simply won't produce or it'll just produce a tiny little head and is not worth growing. So unless you have the room, you're probably better off growing them uh, by a getting cauliflower at the market rather than growing your own. If you have the room, it's a lot of fun. If you have kids or grandkids, it's great. It's like a hidden treasure out in the garden, but you just have to decide if you've got the room to devote to it. Cabbage, the cabbage itself is another one. Again, look at those huge leaves. We usually only see that center part of the cabbage that looks small, like it wouldn't take up very much room. But like the cauliflower, it has two to three foot spread of these very, very large outer leaves that it needs. There are some mini ones available if you really want to grow your own cabbage and the mini ones can be quite nice. You know, they're, they're just enough for, for two people for dinner. So uh, consider that. Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprouts honestly don't grow that well here. Uh, many of us have tried and many of us have been disappointed. 
you need to get them started early. They need to be in the ground in, in August or even in July in order to get growing big enough to be to actually make a tall, uh, tall stock like this. What happens if you plant them now is they won't get very tall before they start to try to produce some of the buds. The other thing is that they often get just full of aphids, which is really nasty to have aphids inside your, um, inside your Brussels sprout. Plus the flavor just doesn't seem to be as good. And it, they grow them over on the coast. And that seems to be a better place to grow them in general than here. But you know, if you want to give it a try, go for it. It's your garden, have fun, experiment. Maybe you'll find the right way to grow them. So finally, kohlrabi, an unusual one. Many people haven't heard of this before. They're small, it's hard to tell, I realize from this picture, but, but they're about the size of a beet. They're very crisp and juicy. I like to eat them raw, uh, like, a, like carrot and celery sticks. They just chop it up and, and crunch on them like that. And they, you can space them quite close together, about six inches apart. And the leaves are tender and tasty as well. Plus, they look so cool in the garden. I just think they look like little spaceships have landed in my garden. I love them, especially the purple ones. Okay. So any questions on cabbage family or peas? Yes. Um, so on peas, we got a question, which I th is now the right time to plant peas? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can still plant them from seed. OK, we got a question about seed saving with peas. Do peas cross pollinate so you shouldn't plant different varieties too close to each other or not? Peas tend to be self-pollinated, but if you're being very careful, you would want to plant them you know, a little bit apart from another plant. I mean, by a little bit apart, just a, a couple of feet away, just don't have them growing right next to each other. In, in general, the, the flowers are self-pollinating, so it shouldn't be a problem. And we had a couple of questions that I think can be combined. One person says, only two of my cabbages formed heads last year. Why? And another person asked, um, said, the pollinators are not very active in the winter. Do we need to hand pollinate winter vegetables? Can you address those two? So <clears throat> most winter vegetables are not flowering ones. They, they aren't producing um, they aren't producing fruit, which is what we need the pollination for. Uh, so you think about it, peas and favas are about the only things that have flowers and then produce the fruit from them. All of the rest of these, we're eating the leaves, we're eating the stalk, we're eating the roots. So pollinators generally are not an issue for, for winter vegetables. The cabbage not producing, it might have been too crowded. They don't produce well if they're crowded. It might have needed a little more nitrogen. Uh, it might have been too shaded. If they don't have enough sun, they won't, they won't produce. So it's, it's hard to say after the fact, but those are some of the things to think about. Okay, I think that's the main questions for this section. All right, over to you, Laura. Okay, so we'll be talking about uh, some of the other greens. And um, I noticed somebody asked a question about growing things in containers. Any of these vegetables can be grow grown in containers. Just make sure that it's big enough and deep enough for the roots. So bigger plants, bigger roots, smaller plants, smaller roots. But any, any of these vegetables we're talking about do great in containers. So um, chard is one very popular thing to grow in your garden. It's very easy to grow. Um, very versatile using it. You'll notice it has these stems and then the leaves. And if they get a little bit bigger, the stems are kind of a texture from the leaves. So if you're cooking them, you might want to put the stems in first and then the leaves to make them balance or use leaves and salad and stems and stir fry or the whole thing. I mean, there, there's a lot you can do with them. And they come in all different colors, white or red, or you can get rainbow mixed. Um, they are very closely related to the beetle 
almost the same thing, except it doesn't have that that root that you eat. Um, and this is something you pick and the outer leaves, the more mature ones as you go along, more leaves keep uh, coming up in the middle. So you don't have to wait and harvest an entire plant. You can eat as you go along. Just make sure to leave enough leaves still on the plant um, with anything that you're picking from the outside that it can still photosynthesize and get more energy so that it, it can continue to, to uh, put out more leaves. So there are a couple of pests that you want to watch out with for chard. One is the chard leaf miner, and you see the same thing with beets. So you see this kind of curly path going through the leaf. That's actually inside the tissue of the leaf. So what happens is you have this little leaf miner. And uh, citrus gets a different leaf miner. You may have seen this uh, uh, pattern on uh, special newer leaves of citrus plants. But the chard leaf miner, uh, the leaf miner that attacks uh, chard and beets and sometimes spinach, um, will this uh, insect will lay its leg. Uh, legs, eggs inside the leaf, and then the, they hatch the larvae kind of crawl out through the leaf. So even if you wanted to spray it with something, you couldn't because it's inside the leaf in, within the tissues. Um, so this is something if it's just a little bit, um, you can just tear that part off, use the rest of the leaf, no problem whatsoever. Um, usually it doesn't get too bad. If it does, and, and there's a lot of infestation there, don't throw that infested part in the compost because it'll hatch and, and uh, continue in your garden. So, you know, throw that out. You might also uh, see some uh, of those eggs, the lower left on the underside of the leaf. So that's one thing to really watch out with uh, for pests when you're checking with pests. Most of them you find on the underside of the leaves. So be sure to turn the, the leaf over and look underneath. Underneath. Another thing that you can get on, on chart are aphids. Um, and you'll notice maybe in, in your garden, if you're out kind of observing what's going on in there, that you have different colored aphids on different vegetables. So different ones, sometimes gray aphids, sometimes black aphids, um, different uh, varieties of aphids are attracted to different vegetables. Um, so you, you don't find them kind of mixed on there. Again, this is an advantage of uh, cool season gardening. You don't have as many aphid problems, um, but you might have some couple things you can do. One is just uh, wash them off with a strong jet of water. Most of them will be what I've read is fatally traumatized and uh, fall to the ground. You may have to do that a few times to, to get most of them. Also, there are beneficial insects that will come in and eat those. And you can attract those beneficials either by having flowers that, that attract them or um, leave something for them to eat. Uh, ladybugs being one example. Um, and the ladybugs, both in the beetle stage that we see in, in, or the bug stage, and then also the uh, larval stage will eat a lot of those. So if you don't have a severe infestation and you leave a few and they have something to eat, they'll stay around in your garden. And next time you have a problem, um, they'll be there. Some insects too, you can spray with a little bit of either soapy water or some oil, like maybe a teaspoon of liquid soap in a, in a quart of water or a teaspoon of vegetable oil, teaspoon to a tablespoon, and spray that on there. Um, what happens is a lot of these bugs kind of breathe through their skin, so it suffocates them without really being a chemical that's you know going to do a damage because these are something that you're planning to eat. Uh, so you want to be careful what you put on there or uh, what goes into your soil. OK, so uh, we also have, um, oh, this is an example of nature um, taking care of the problem. These are parasitic wasps that come in and they lay their eggs inside of the aphids they hatch in there and then eat their way out. So if you see these kind of like shells of aphids with a round hole in them, um, that means that nature is taking its course. And if you don't have too bad an infestation, let it happen. And, and so you've got this ecosystem going in your garden. So this is wonderful. Nature can do a lot of the, the work for you. Okay, another thing that we might plant is spinach. So spinach is a cool season vegetable. Um, there are a couple things called spinach that uh, are warm season, but they're not a true spinach, something like a New Zealand spinach or a Malabar spinach. These are true spinaches and they grow in the winter. Um, they don't seem to be as um, 
tender and juicy and easy to eat as the lettuces. So uh, they're a little bit stronger, a little bit tougher leaf. So they're not as, as susceptible to some of the pests. Um, if you're growing spinach, you can eat it raw. You can throw a few in a, a smoothie or vegetable juice. Um, you can cook them. You know, put some in lasagna or in a stir fry or um, even just uh, sauteed them or something like that, boil them. Um, keep in mind, if you haven't done that before, that it really cooks down a lot. So you might pick a whole big colander of spinach and then you'll get like a cup of cooked spinach. So uh, plant more than you think you're uh, going to need if, if you're... Uh, uh, going to be cooking it. Uh, it looks like more than it turns out to be when you cook it down. So these are another one where you can eat the outer leaves as they grow and more shoots will come up from the beginning so you can keep going. You can also do six, what we call succession planning planting. So if you want to eat them over a longer period of season, maybe plant more seeds every week or every two weeks. And that way you can keep harvesting it over a longer period of time. Okay, uh, kale is a, another good one. And out of your garden, it's probably more nutritious than it would be uh, deep fried and salted in a cellophane bag. <laughs> um, but this has been a very, very popular one over the, over the last few years. Um, I have kale. Uh, somebody gave me a kale plant in a one gallon pot about 15 years ago, and I am still eating from that same plant. Um, have not replanted uh, it. What I do is after it gets bigger, a little bit taller, maybe starts to branch, it looks like it's going to start to form seeds, is I'll cut off a piece of it, maybe a foot, foot and a half from the top, take some of the lower leaves off so those nodes can form roots and stick it in uh, back in a, a pot. I grow them in, in five gallon pots. Now these uh, do grow year round, but <laughs> During the summer, they get so many pests that they're pretty much inedible. You look at the bottom of the leaves and it's full of aphids and mealybugs and giant white flies and all sorts of things. So I don't put it right in my garden. I put it a little bit away from the garden in pots and I kind of have that as my decoy plant. It attracts a lot of the pests and, and keeps them away from uh, the rest of the garden. So I'll just maybe plant six more, six new ones from cuttings from the first one every year. And I've got that going all the time. And I eat it all winter. It's there all summer, but I eat it in the winter. I've also been planting a couple times um, last couple of years, collard greens, very similar to this. But I noticed that the harlequin bugs that, that um, Karen was showing, really just love those collard greens. They didn't really bother the, the kale next to it. So I think I'm going to give them one more year <laughs> and hopefully they, they won't uh, have so many problems. So here's how uh, harvesting the, the kale, same with the other greens. Take the lower outer leaves first. They've been growing longer. And this is also what I do when I'm uh, rerooting them. And I just take a, some off the bottom and stick it in because the you know roots will grow from the, those nodes. Um, and just kind of keep going. And, and uh, all year round or like with mine for 15 years. So that it's, it's very versatile. You can cook it a lot of different, different ways. Also, um, another one is mustard. So this uh, giant red mustard, I first discovered this up at uh, Gamble Gardens in um, Palo Alto and was uh, struck by the beauty. These leaves get to about a foot and a half long and uh, they have kind of a uh, horseradish flavor to them. So I like to put them on a sandwich and they kind of take the place of both lettuce and horseradish. They've got that kind of bite. And they will, um, at the end of the season, they'll put up a seed head so you can take those seeds and, and replant them. So just something a little bit different. And then you'll, you have a lot of the Asian greens, uh, which would be in this category. And these are, you know, you, you don't have to go to an Asian market anymore. You can find these in a lot of different places. Uh, bok choy, pak choy, uh, tatsoi, all these different vegetables. Again, they can be eaten raw, they can be used in stir fries, very versatile. And they're becoming more common, especially with uh, the proliferation of, of uh, farmer's markets. It, it's a, a lot easier to find these and, and get more variety um, in your diet. 
Any quick questions on those before Karen talks about root vegetables? Um, yeah, one question is about Malabar spinach. Can you grow it through the winter? Yes, and I do that with uh, my New Zealand spinach. And Karen and I had had a conversation about that. She said, but that, that's a warm season vegetable. I said, I grow it all cold, all cool season and eat it all winter long. So yeah, I mean, if it grows, great. You know, my, mine grows well in the winter because I don't water it. Um, but it gets the rain in the winter. So just give it a try. That's, that's the one fun thing about uh, gardening is he, it's like an ongoing experiment. So give it a try. And um, if it works fine, if not, oh well, but it, it probably will grow. Um, one interesting question was, are cabbage and cauliflower leaves typically eaten? And, and I'm kind of wondering, why aren't they just like kale? Because they're tough, they they so we've developed all parts of the uh, of the cabbage family to eat, but we've specialized in them. So so kale and the cabbage itself are more tender, but the, those outer leaves are quite tough, and so not not as pleasant to eat. So you could eat them. I mean, if you were in a starvation situation, yes, you could eat them. Um, I have one more question I'd like to ask about the, the um, cabbages, even though it's a little behind. What would cause a cabbage plant not to make a head? Uh, well, if it doesn't have enough sun, if it is too crowded, if it was planted too late, so it just ends up uh, going to seed, uh, if, it, uh, if it doesn't have enough fertilizer, so a number of things. I would just okay. like to answer one, one more question that I've been seeing a lot. People are asking a lot about seeds. So some of these plants uh, put up seeds. So you want to, you know, wait till the, the seed is mature to take it off. So most of these, it would be, you know, kind of dry up a little, a little bit brown, a little hard. If it's still soft and green, it's not mature. So once it's mature, then it's best to wait and take it off um, then. And, and if it's mature, it's ready to plant at any time. I, I will add that it, it takes surprisingly long sometimes to go from flower to dry mature seeds. So you, if you want to um, say if you have some lettuce that you want to grow and you end up growing where you plan to put your tomatoes in, you know, it might take longer than you're expecting for that lettuce seed to dry. Yep. True. Yep. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to root crops here. So uh, beets can actually grow just fine in the summer as well, but in the winter, they won't bolt. They won't go to seed nearly as quickly as they will in the summer. And that's true for several of these others as well. So you can plant your beets now. They will start sizing up. And again, you can be harvesting them December, January, February, Probably in about March when it starts to warm up is when they will finally start to send up a flower stock and then you have to get them out of their fat because they'll get woody otherwise. So beets are very closely related to chard as, as Laura said, it really we specialize, we grew this one specially for, uh, for the nice plump root. And, but the leaves are edible, which many people don't realize. In my family, we loved beet greens. I think we didn't, we weren't that fond of the beets themselves, but we all loved the beet greens. So we grew the beets for the greens. If you're going to harvest them, again, as Laura has said, you can't harvest all of those leaves at once, especially with the beets because they are feeding those roots down underneath. So only take off some of the largest outermost ones, no more than a third of the leaves off of any one beet. Uh, you can also, though, if you're thinning them, you could take the thinnings entirely. So beet seeds are these really weird looking nubbly things. The chard, chard looks just like this too. You can't tell the difference between them by looking at the seed. And the reason is that they, this is actually a seed cluster. This isn't a single seed. So I planted two seeds in this pot. And down in the lower left, you can see two seedlings have come up out of it. 
And in the upper one, there are, I believe, five out of that single seed. So when you, are, when you plant them, it is absolutely essential that you thin these. And we recommend rather than trying to uh, take them apart and, and carefully transplant them, it's really better to simply snip off the weakest ones and just leave the strongest one growing. Because if you try to, to pull them, you'll damage the roots. And, and, but even trying to uh, separate them and transplant them is a little difficult. And you wouldn't do that until they had their true leaves. These just have the seed leaves on them right now. Beets often grow, beets and turnips often grow with their shoulders exposed. This is perfectly normal. This is nothing to worry about. In fact, I grow a, a variety, these golden ones. You can see the difference between the, the brownish top on the bottom and the bright orange underneath. That's how far out of the soil these were growing. And it's fine. If they're not like potatoes where the exposed, with the uh, exposed potato, it's actually developing a toxin that makes them inedible to us as humans, poisonous to us as humans. So don't, you don't want to eat your green potatoes. But with beets and turnips and carrots, it is absolutely no problem. So don't worry about healing it up or anything like that. So carrots are another fine root crop. They, because they're so long and skinny like this, they need very well prepared soil, very light, very loose. Uh, they're often grown in quite sandy soil. Uh, they're a good candidate to grow in, in um, uh, containers because we do have this clay soil, it's a bit heavy. If you're going to grow them in the soil, it's better to choose the blunter type than the really long pointed ones. If they encounter some resistance as they're growing, and it can just be a rock, a little bit of hard soil, they will do what's called forking. And you see some fine examples of forked carrots here on the, the right hand side. Forking happens anytime there's a damage to that root tip. So I've been seeing uh, uh, six packs of carrots available in nurseries for transplanting. So I was curious about this and I tried growing some in six packs and transplanting them myself. So carrots look very wispy and tiny and they look like you couldn't possibly transplant them. They're actually surprisingly tough, but the problem is that it does damage the root tip and you end up with a huge number of these forked carrots. So we recommend in general against it. That said, I know gardeners who routinely thin their carrots and transplant those thinnings. And I, I would assume they could also transplant them from six packs and they have the touch. So maybe it's just something that will come with practice if we feel like practicing. All right. So Again, with beets and carrots, it is absolutely essential that they are thinned enough to the proper distance because they won't produce a root, especially those big fat beets. But the carrots as well, they won't produce a root if they don't have enough room to grow. So you can't save every single seedling. All right. So other root crops, radishes, rutabagas, turnips. Radishes and turnips are very, very fast. And they're kind of an exception to this rule that, uh, that things are refrigerated in the winter here and will last a long time. They are both quite, tend to be very fast and you should harvest them as soon as they are, as soon as they are, are mature. Uh, radishes in particular, they will bolt and get woody very quickly. Rutabagas take a surprisingly long time and they will, it will be, from now until spring before your rutabagas are ready. Fennel is an Italian uh, vegetable, sometimes called anise in the grocery stores. It grows beautifully here. In fact, it can become a pest uh, and, and will reseed extremely easily, but it's delicious and crisp. And uh, if you're not sure if you like it, it's easy to find in the grocery stores, buy a bulb that has a slight anise flavor and is delicious. If you do let it go to seed, 
uh, the flowers are tasty and you can also save the seeds. You know, traditionally used in, in many Italian uh, things, Italian sausage and things like that. Faba beans also grow beautifully in the winter here. And as Lorna mentioned, they can be grown as a cover crop. So plant them now, you'll start seeing the flowers appear. They won't start forming the beans until it's gotten late enough and warm enough. So like about March or so, you'll actually start seeing beans forming even though you may be seeing flowers in January. Um, if you're going to grow them, if you're going to grow them for the beans, that's great. Then you'll be harvesting them in the spring and that's delicious. You can, if you miss planting them here in the fall, you can also plant them in the spring. If you're growing them as a cover crop, both bay and peas are nitrogen fixed. They're part of the legume family. And that means that they form these little white nodules there and they are taking nitrogen from the air, from the atmosphere and storing it in the plant roots. So that's one of the reasons they're often grown as a cover crop, as a green manure. The problem is that the height of their nitrogen uh, acquisition is just as they flower and are about to start forming the seeds because the seeds, the beans, are what they're storing that nitrogen for. They're going to use all of that nitrogen they store to make the, the beans, which is why beans are so nutritious for us to eat also. So Laura said her technique is she plants it thickly and then as they flower, she cuts out every other one or, or something like that, leaves, leaves some to, be, uh, to go on to form the seeds to eat and the rest of them have just become now nitrogen to feed the soil. So we highly recommend growing a cool season, season garden. We hope that we have inspired you. Uh, if you have questions, well, we'll take some additional questions now. Uh, let me put up the slide with a bunch of information here. We have a garden health site on a section on our website, so please do look at that. Many other events that are listed. We, uh, one of our fellow master gardeners has done a three-part series on cool season vegetables. So is this one a little fast for you? If you want more information, if you'd like to get it from somebody else's point of view, I highly recommend watching Candace's three episodes. Those are available now on our YouTube channel. And we have many other things. We have a help desk. If you have questions about anything in your garden, please contact us. If you're in Santa Clara County, that is, we're advising Santa Clara County residents. If you're not from Santa Clara County, find your local Master Gardener program. So, Louise, do we have questions? Can I, can I, um, I saw a couple of questions come in uh, about seeds that, that I would like to address first. One is, um, where are the seeds on the plants? So when Karen was talking about fruits and vegetables, so fruits and vegetables have a different definition in the kitchen than they do in the garden. So in the garden, things that we call a fruit have the seeds inside. Um, like tomatoes, cucumber, squash, and then we were talking about fava beans and peas. Those have the seeds inside. But most of the uh, winter vegetables are actually the vegetative part. Um, and usually a seed head will go up at the very end. And Karen mentioned you have to wait a long time for that sometimes. So like with beets, um, at the very top of the plant, eventually you'll get a seed head. Uh, the mustards, the, the uh, uh, lettuce, a lot of it will come at the top and, and you may have to wait for a while for that to appear, or for that to be matured. And some things like carrots that are biennials, it'll take two years. Um, and then another question I saw several people um, ask was about about planting seeds now in the smoke. So from the point of view of a seed, it's not really going to make much of a difference. Um, the soil, you may want to add some compost anyway, but uh, even more so right now. Um, it's really from the point of the view of the gardener, if you really want to be out in your <laughs> garden right now in the smoke. I'm not going outside. Mine are going to have to wait and just do the best they can. Um, and if you want to learn more about the effect of the smoke on this uh, slide that's up, um, the third one down, Tips and Events Monthly Newsletter, um, this current issue has a lot of information on what to do about that. 